Welcome to the show. I'm Roger Wakefield, Lead AP, the expert plumber, coming to you right here on YouTube and Facebook and everywhere that we're at. Today we're talking about tools you need to start a plumbing business. And sometimes it's not just hand tools like you would think. I want to jump over into the comments real quick. I know I'm running a little bit behind. Kel L says, hi, I need to know my shower faucet handle broke off. Mowing Positemp needs a cartridge. Can I do myself? What tools do I need? You know, one big thing for the mowing, you, you need a cartridge remover. Uh, man, they're a pain, but it, it, it can work. I can't do above. What would a plumber do and charge? You know, Kelly, it, it depends on where you're at. Uh, yeah, there you go. Sean's already on it. I love that. Might need a mowing cartridge removing tool. Home Depot sells it. Turn your water off and try and take the cartridge out. All right, making sure everybody can hear me real quick. Uh, can everybody hear me? If you can hear me, say, sounds good. I'm assuming yes, because nobody's told me we can't hear you. Good deal. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean, might need a bone cartridge removing tool, man. Those things are necessity. Uh, Oh, the whole thing is broken off wall. Kella, what I'd say is take some pictures. Yeah, there you go. Get in the Discord or the subreddit. Take pictures, post them over there. Sean, put the link in right there. Kel, I can't do Discord either. Uh, there, there you go. Sean's got you covered. Go to the subreddit group right there. That will get you in and get things done. Guy, if, if I'm sounding rough today, uh, I've had food poisoning. I literally have not eaten in 48 hours. I was in bed for 36 hours before I got up and came in here. Uh, it's rough. I, I ate something at the Nashville airport. I'm telling you, it did not go good with me. I have been drinking limited water. The first night I slept, I did not sleep longer than like two to five minutes at a time. I'd have to get up and go to the bathroom. So it's been tough. Hello, Sean Strong. Good morning to you, sir. Brother Colton in the house. What is happening? Good morning, crew. Kel L says, no computer. I have a vision disability. Aha. Kel, that'll be tough then. Uh, it, it's it's e always easier if we can see the pictures and know. Until then, it's really hard to give you a, a true answer. Main master, what is up? Says, Can't use your phone for Discord or subreddit, meaning, yeah, I think you can. Carter Bounce, how we doing? Dre Medic says, hello, everyone. Happy Easter. That's right. Yesterday was Good Friday. Today is Saturday, and tomorrow is Easter Sunday. Love that. Happy Easter to everybody. Roger is American. Join us in the Discord group and the subreddit. There you go. Jason Smith says he's Asian. Man, I am Texan, y'all. That's, that's what I am. Uh, yes, see that looky there, Sean's all over it. Uh, Paul Johnson, thank you very much. Me, master, and yeah, did y'all really think I was anything but Texan? Come on, uh, there's another link to the subreddit right there or the Discord group and the subreddit. If y'all are in either one of those, will you just put in subreddit? Discord. That that way I know where y'all are at or, and what y'all are doing in there. I do try to jump in every now and then. It's just, man, I've been running like crazy here lately. Randy Dowden, how we doing? Jonathan Wheeler, good morning to you. Guys, y'all definitely want to hang around today. Man, I've got a guest in here today that is phenomenal. Uh, the owner, or, or was the owner, I guess he sold it times now, but with Baker Brothers, he is now the president of Baker Brothers, one of the biggest plumbing companies in Dallas. And I just got to interview him for a podcast. And I got to say it was phenomenal. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, we got sounds good. I love that. Good. Got a lot of response. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. And it just jumped on me like it normally does. Okay. And Mustafa says, best way to grow in residential. Uh, we've grown with management companies, but residential is a struggle. And that's what we started using social media for, getting out and letting people know what we were doing, why we were doing it, and how we were doing it. That really helped a lot. Hell, we need to figure out pictures somehow, somewhat. Okay, I'll a little more. 
Andrew Ocarenza says, improve the camera focus. Which one? Camera one looks pretty good. Camera two is a little off. Camera three is a little off. Hey, Alex or Brett, camera two and three focus are way off. Uh, let's go to camera three right there first. All right, Andrew, thank you for the heads up. I appreciate that. AD says, is there a list of tools? We have made made a lot of them. Okay, now be careful because that one in front of you is live. Three still not quite right. Andrew, we're working on it. Thank you. That looks pretty close right there. Uh, it did. Okay. All right, we're getting there. All right, now I'm going to go to camera two, which is the third one over here. It may be really hard to get to with all the wires. Right there. Perfect. All right, camera one, camera two, camera three, camera three still out just a little bit. That looks much better. Uh, yeah, perfect. All right, man, Andrew, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Is there a list of tools? Look, we've made a list of what tools, we made videos for a list of what tools we think you know, plumbers need in their initial bag. Meaning if you get a job in plumbing today, what tools are you going to need tomorrow? We, we've made a list of top 10 and actually I think we only listed nine because I left it up to y'all. What do you think is the 10th tool? What do you think is the tool that I didn't put in there? So it, it's kind of neat to get in there and see that. Uh, Kelly says I'm going to have to call a plumber. What, what would a plumber have to order? You know, most plumbers carry mowing cartridges on their truck, Kel, so I don't think you'll have any problem there. But if the handle broke off, it depends on if the handle's reusable or not. So you should be good there. Chris Sheaves, Shreves says, good morning. How are you? Johnson Family Plumbing in the house. Good to see you. Rock versus Jimmy says, good morning. Sean Strong says, hope you're feeling brother, <laughs> better, brother. What's for lunch? I, I tell you what, I don't know. Uh, I know. I think Randy picked up burgers and sausages here. So we are going to cook out in a little bit. I mean, I'm probably not going to be drinking any bourbon today. I'm just going to tell you all that. Uh, literally, the, the the past 48 hours have been tough. John Strong says, Kelly, can you take a picture of it and email it? There you go. Me Master says, lost my message, popped up. Oh, must be a long latency between countries. Uh, well, and I'm probably about five minutes behind right now. Canadian in Chicago now. Subreddit and Discord. Show us what it's all about. There you go. All right, now everybody knows how to get in touch with Sean. You know, part of the big deal about tools, and when you're when you're starting a business, you need to ask yourself, what are you going to focus on? Now, just the basic tools. Everybody knows that they need, you know adjustable pliers, adjustable wrench, tape measures, uh, flashlights, different things like that. Now, if you get into service or you're in construction, you're gonna need completely different tools. So what I always recommend to people first getting in the trade is think about what tools the other plumbers have. What tools are they using regularly? I believe that if you get hired for a job, you need to ask that company, what tools do you expect me to show up with the first day so you have a tool? now? The union's a little bit different. Half your first year, you've got a bag that you get, and this has all your tools in it. Now, they probably did that out. I don't remember. At one point, it was paid for. But getting in, getting your tool bag, getting things to where you've got everything you need is one thing. Most open shop companies, though, when you come in, you've got to supply all your tools. You may be able to borrow some from the plumbers that you're working with. Hey, can, can I use your tape? Can I use your pliers or whatever? And a lot of these guys don't want to share their tools because chances are you're not going to treat them as good as they do. So that's what we made the video for. What 10 tools should you have in your bag to begin with? And getting in, getting the right tools, 
for the company that you work for. Because like I said, residential service, commercial, new construction, it, it doesn't matter. There's a little bit different tools all across the board. Israel Escobar says, I applied to my local union in Chicago, didn't pass the test to get in. Should I leave my non-related plumbing job and get an open shop job or wait to retry again next year? My, my thing is, if you're not going to do anything different, are you going to be able to pass that test a year from now? If it was me, I think I would go ahead and try to find an open shop plumbing job. The union may never let you in. Chicago is one of the hard unions to get in. What I would do is try to get a job learning plumbing now, depending on what their test was like. I'm assuming it was based on plumbing, based on mechanical. What, what can you do to help learn those things? If I were you, I'd go get a, shop, get a job, open shop, doing plumbing. Try to be the very best open shop plumber you can be. Uh, keep replay chat on this one, please. Uh, all you've got to do, I think you can, I'll say this, you scroll down. Kello, you may not be able to. The replay, I think, always stays up. I don't go in and erase the chats. Andrew Lacrenza says, welcome, New York City Plumber. Enjoy your channel. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we worked on it. Trust me. Andrew was right. The focus was off. This looks good. Kel says, what would a plumber need to order? Uh, would it be a shower assembly kit? No, normally, I mean, it's probably just your mowing cartridge, Kel. Uh, if it was me and I was replacing the cartridge, I'd go ahead and replace the handle, the sketch, and everything. You can make it all look brand new. Willie A. B. is up. Edgar Medina says, Milwaukee M12 pop cutter, best one 20 you'll ever spend. I tell you what, it's funny because I just got one of those. Uh, we did a video the other day on, on 10 power tools you need in your bag. And it's funny because the, 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 the cutters that I didn't have. Uh, so I ordered me one. I, go, uh, I do, I like it. It's great for tight spots. Mike Reed, hello from the United Kingdom. How are you doing in here today? Longfield Hero says, installed seven $600 totals yesterday at a mansion in Colorado. They have weird flange mounts. You know, the problem I ran into on the, on the Toto, we did a toilet change out at my house the other day because we wanted to see, we, we bought the cheapest toilet we could find on Amazon. It was an American standard. And one of the more expensive ones, we, we found a Kohler and a Toto. Great toilets. The Toto, the way the back's made, I couldn't install on my house without cutting and reconfiguring my water. It came out right where the back of the toilet was. But yeah, if you're talking about that plastic boot that has the, where the toilet sets down in, I completely agree with you. They're different, but I've, I've seen a lot of them here lately. Josh has did a series of videos showing off most of my tools and put them in the subreddit. John Strong says, uh, Zomfield Hero, have you ever done a Toto? But I have never done a Toto. You know, they're good toilets. Uh, I've installed a lot of Toto toilets before. I just wasn't able to install this one in my house. I could have. I just didn't feel like redoing the water line at that time. MJ Miranda Saxal, how are we doing? Or Zach Sax? There we go. Hey, Roger, what do you think is a fair price to charge for a house call? Where I'm going to fix a kitchen faucet or shower head here in Los Angeles. I'm just starting off. You know, number one, what I tell you I think would be a fair price around here may not be what's fair there. You've got to know what your local economy, what, what things are going for. And it can be different. Uh, you're going to fix a kitchen faucet, well, or even a shower head. What kind of faucet? Are you going to repair it, replace the cartridges? You're going to change it out? There's so many different things there to know. But what I'll tell you is you need to know what your economy is capable of, your community. Prices for plumbers are, are different all across the country. I know. California and up in New York, they can be much as the plumbers already making $70, 80 $100 an hour. Be very interesting. Five is the door looks good. Six looks good. Seven looks good. A little widened out because I think we're over too far on the right side. And nothing on eight. Sorry about that. We had to check some cameras real quick. Uh, Zombiefield says, apparently they're very good for swapping a bidet in. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, and that was really why we shot these videos the other day. 
I've had a, an American standard bidet toilet seat in my front bathroom. Recently, I put a Kohler bidet seat in my back bathroom. And then whenever we swapped out the toilets, I ended up putting, God, I don't even know which toilet I put back. I went back in with the American standard toilet where I couldn't put the total in, but I put the total toilet seat on it, the bidet toilet seat. I tell you what, pretty that gun good bidet seat. Rapsies, how are we doing? Good to see you in here. Uh, charge what you're worth. I think a lot of places in LA, California are going to be $200 an hour. Charge what you need to cover your overhead and get paid. And like I said, it's different around the country. I know plumbing companies here in the Dallas area charging and not charging. Their price books are based on somewhere between four and $500 an hour. There's a lot of things to figure out there. You've got to figure out what's it going to cost you for the very best trained plumber, the, the, the best plumber that there is. That's how you base your pricing on it. And then you start trying to hire those best plumbers. Hello. Hope you have a speedy recovery. Happy Easter to you. Thank you very much. Rep C's, you missed everything. Uh, just about to shut it down, boy, and that's the truth. All right. Chase Crapple says basin wrench for sinks. I think that is a big one that a lot of plumbers need. I remember going out on jobs, I didn't have a basin wrench. So I'm trying to use a small pair of channel locks, a crescent, anything I can to get up in there. So a big deal. Good soldering kit, drill, sawzall, tape measure, thread tape, pop cutters, good range of channel locks. And, you know, I used to buy the, the channel lock brand with the multi sizes, and I love that thing. I'll experience this as new year channel. I recently watched one of your videos and it really helped with an install. Thank you. You're welcome. Andrew Lacerda says 180 an hour in New York City. Now, is that what companies are charging for plumbers or is, is that what plumbers are making in their total package? Kelly says in Ohio, it's $109 for a service call. Okay, but a service call is normally, that's to get the plumber out to look at it. That's to get them to come out, but but you need this. Okay, we have service calls. We we believe that if I'm going to send out a licensed, trained, drug-tested plumber, we should charge for that. Uh, and a lot of companies don't, and that's fine. But our deal is, I've got to pay to get that truck out there that's got all the parts on it. And that licensed drug tested background check plumber, it, it's worth something. So kind of me, what I like about the service call, you get somebody out to actually look at it, give you eyes on, and then give you hopefully upfront pricing and let you know exactly how much it's going to cost to get it fixed. Sean Strong says when it comes to tools, don't sleep on the cheap ones. Yeah, cheap tools are not good. Uh, some of my favorite tools are Husky from Home Depot. The best tools are the ones you can afford, and they don't break. In Italy, it's around 70 euros an hour. Uh, Rap Z, how does that translate to dollars? Just because I don't have all that figured out. Israel Escobar says, I have a few different size rotting machines. Do I need a license to do drain cleaning jobs in Illinois? Uh, you need to check with the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction in Illinois. Here in Texas, you do have to have either a tradesman or a drain cleaner's registration on your apprentice card. So, and I think that's a good idea. Sean Strong says the company I'm at is $90 an hour, but this is Western Nebraska. Fix It Guy says finally about to catch a live. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Sean Strong, Israel Escobar, I don't know about Illinois, but you don't need a license for drains where I am. And Sean, if I were you, I'd buy me a drain cleaning machine. I'd buy a hydro jetter and I would own the world then. Did make it. I was doing drain cleaning in residential in California, 125. Andrew says that's what I charge per hour of work, and it jumped on me. So I charge per hour of work, and pretty much all other companies charge around 160 to 200, not counting material costs. I fix it by says knee pads, a cheap back brace for heavy lifts and willingness to never stop learning. Man, that, that's tools right there. I love that. 
knee pads because you know what? You're going to get on your knees and work. A cheap back brace for heavy lift. You know what? Protect yourself as always you can. A willingness to never stop learning. That is huge. Oregon non union plumbers make 38 to 60. Wow. Sean G says attitude is an invaluable tool. Amen. Me, Master says, in Texas, does septic waste go through the same pipes and gutters as drains go through? Well, hopefully, septic waste doesn't go through gutters, but it, it can go through the same pipes, but it comes out different ways. Septic, you've got to have a special license in Texas to work on. On the five heroes is working to the bone. That is for newbies, too. All right, Randy, we about ready to move. <sighs> Fix it, guys, says Sean G. Strong. That's so true. Working on the bottom. Randy, will you go there and grab my phone off my desk, please? <clears throat> all right, all right. Check one, two. Okay, good. Check the microphone there. Hey, Randy. Trying to make trying to make sure we got everything set up before I head out to the other cameras. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jimmy, I'll back up. Almost. Okay. I only see one receiver in here. Making the magic happen, guys. Man, good catch. Uh, when you're an apprentice making 25, see, that is fantastic. Sean Strong, just as you're flying through your comments today, I'm trying. That was look, I don't know how long I'm going to make it today. I'm trying to go the whole day. Uh, those of y'all that didn't hear me, I have had uh, food poisoning. I have not eaten in 48 hours. Uh, I got home from Nashville, eight o'clock Thursday night and did not get out of bed till eight o'clock this morning. And man, it's been a tough trip. Mikey Pops, I see that now. Thank you very much. Want to talk to whoever did my title and fix that next time. Me master says, yeah, because in Australia, gutters and drains are separate to the septic waste. Good deal. Roger seems sad. I hope all is okay. Uh, Roger's not sad. Roger's just, Roger's had a, a, a rough 48 hours. Luke B in the house says, been working, doing renovations for a small company of a decent plumbing understanding. Curious how I should expect to work. I mean, I did a math school program. Here's the deal. I don't know how long it'll take you to get certified, but man, whenever in your area, it's going to be different all around the country, but do everything you can to figure it out. Get your license. Get you can. David Gutierrez, I'm a master plumber in Kansas, and I'm wanting to start my own residential plumbing business. I can get everything as far as paperwork and insurance. The only thing I can't figure out how to make the phone ring. Any advice? You know, David, that's why I started doing social media. Uh, marketing is big. Uh, you've got to get your name out there and, and make it happen. Sean Strong says he's not feeling 100%, but when you're Roger Wakefield, your 40% is better than most people's 101. Brother, thank you. Uh, I'm not feeling bad. I just don't feel great. Uh, I know I need something to eat, just not sure what that is. So uh, I'm working on it. Uh, fix it, guys, says that is never fun. You're right. Christian says, also had food poisoning this week, even went to the ER. Uh, I thought about it. Uh, literally Friday night, no, Thursday night, man, it, I had nothing but pure water coming out both ends. Then I got the hiccups. Then I started cramping, and I started cramping so bad, I thought my, my legs, my chest, my ribs, my back, everything was on fire. Randy, you good? 
Uh, we need to plug the receiver in here no, for his. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm ready to move when you are. I want to say thank you to Pop It Up Plumbing and Auto, $10 Super Chat. I love that. Thank you. I, I do appreciate it. This is Christian. It's no fun. Hope you're feeling better. Man. Zombie Field Hero says the main master. Yeah, most areas, the sewer lines are always isolated because it has to be treated differently. That's for sure. You're welcome. What's your take on doing solo businesses? You know, it, look, most of us that start a business start out as one man. There's nothing wrong with it. You can actually make good money as a solo business. I just like the idea of growing and getting better. Are you all ready? Go straight to five what? Okay. All right, boys and girls, y'all hang on. I am fixing to head up to the shop. We're going to fire up the grill. Uh, and then you get to meet my special guest. Jimmy Dale from Baker Brothers Plumbing here in the Dallas area. Probably the biggest plumbing in the Dallas area, the biggest plumbing company. And man, he is just full of knowledge. Great guy. So we're going to head out there now. Make sure you get in, ask your questions. And I will see y'all here in just a moment. Are you ready? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Oh. All right, Randy, you can switch cameras whenever you want. If you think about it. I'm not, oh, I'm not live. All right. So first of all, number one, Jimmy Dale, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Oh, great, great. Yeah, you know, this has been fun because those of y'all that don't know, I'm I've started a new podcast. Got to interview Jimmy Dale for it a while ago. And to get him in here was phenomenal. The way I'm feeling, I probably would not have come in today. I'd have, <laughs> I'd have, I'd have called. I said, "Y'all cancel it. Don't worry about it." But I knew Jimmy Dell was coming, so I'm like, "I am not going to miss this." Uh, tell everybody a little bit about you, what you do, how you got started, and where you are. Yeah. Um, well, I I started like you know right out of college. Uh, you know, I started way. I think I actually went my first plumbing job in third grade. I always tell everybody, I go, yeah, the second grade I got my bike stolen. Third grade, my dad said, oh, hey, if you want to get your bike back, uh, I'll pay you $5 a time. So I was just cleaning fittings, you know, little eight-year-old kid. Uh, went to work with dad over the years, and basically, you know, he said, hey, look, if you don't go to school, make a grade, you're in this ditch. And then I went to school, made good grades, got out. He talked me in about, about my junior year, started saying, hey, I, you know, I want you to come work for me. I was like, all right. I go, Dad, you do $350,000 a year. You're taking 100 It was good money back in 93. But I was like, you don't have enough money to pay me 27000 to come to work for you. And he's like, I'll let me worry about that. So I did, thinking, hey, I'll probably be here two years. And then you know, do a family obligation two years. And so 30-something years later, I'm still doing the same thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that two years can turn into a whole lifetime. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is, and, you know, we – I mean, y'all are going to have to check out this podcast. But to, to get in and, and see, you know, when I sold my company, it was a $1 million a year company. Y'all are going to hit $100 million this year, pretty daggum close to it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're going to be right at, you know, you know, right at about $100 million. So now we do plumbing, AC, electric. So we do all three trades. Um, yeah, I saw. I bought it from Dad in 2018, and you know we did we did the transaction. But you know, I, I tell people that are going to do, you know, hey, I'm going to pass on to my son. A lot of guys go, hey, let me let me, you know, oh, I'll let you pay it out and all this stuff. And I was like, so I went to the bank and got a loan and said, hey, Dad, here's a check. And, and the reason what you know that's that's a big thing. And the reason why was because I told Dad, like, you've been doing this 38 years. You need to have your money. I go, I, I'm a grown man. If I fail and don't make good decisions, then you know, I'll file bankruptcy or whatever I need to do. But I said, Dad, you, you've you been 38 years. I, I go, it almost worried me that like every no, decision I, I make yeah. is like might affect your retirement. So I, I think it's always the thing to get the, the, the kids or the family involved, make sure that they have skin in the game. If they can holistically do it, great. 
if they can just partially do it, just have some kind of skin in the game. And so from and I did I worked to work hard, but man, in two thousand eight, when I had that, I had I put twenty seven thousand dollars a month uh, on the company like cash out the door, and I was like, oh my gosh, and I mean had to grow. I was like, hey, we got to grow because I need to make that a smaller percentage of the whole. So that's what we did. And then, you know, we grew a lot and then we kept growing. And in 2017, I sold to Wrench Group and still a part of Wrench Group. Um, right now, I'm the president of Baker Brothers. They they just kind of an autonomous thing. It's like, hey, you just keep running it, you know, and, and we get you make your own decisions. You know, and it's been good. I mean, it's, it's really helped me to kind of be able to get, to, I don't know if I'd be able to get to $100 million dollars without all the guys from Ranch Group, the guys that were ahead of me that like taught me stuff that, you know, I went out to their facilities and learned more. And I think that's what we all have to do, just just keep getting out there and learning more. And if you want to, if you want to, you know, I saw somebody one time at a point, we had like a bunch of employees and we were going, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy because it was just so hard and tough. But, you know, I always tell everybody, you got to find your sweet spot. Like, you know, it could be small, it could be hash, want six trucks, 10 trucks. I want, you know, a hundred, whatever, whatever the goal is, I think you just got to kind of chase it and kind of understand what you're, you know, having to do, what you're having to give up to get those things done. Um, you know, but there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of greatness in having you know, our, our companies don't get more efficient as they get larger, <laughs> they get less efficient. So it, it's, it's, there's a lot to do. So it just depends on, you know, I've talked to a lot of guys and I said, man, where you're at is great, man. You're, you're running like, you know, 15 trucks and you're running 30% profit, Billy. Oh, I mean, that's right. insane. Yeah. And I go, so I go, you get, because I am, you're, you're not going to see 30% ever again. I go, <laughs> I go, you'll be lucky to be getting 12 to 14 to 15. So, you know, I, I think that's the important thing is, you know, we always look at other people sometimes and go, oh my gosh, man, it's so amazing. And then, you know, there's times you go, man, I look back and go into a small shop and go, wow, this was really cool. I remember back when we were this way, you know, yeah. and I'll never forget being in Abilene and going to a 10 trucks shop. It was like, man, they had three people in the office and, and plus the guy who's running it. And just kind of, there was like this, you know, quaint, small family, you know, just together feel. But then it's funny as, as I was like going, Oh, that was so awesome. Uh, the next day, one of the guys, something happened and they're missing one of the people in the office. And I forgot when that happened that you had to do twice as much work. <laughs> I forgot yeah. about that part. I go, where if you, if you went on vacation or they went on vacation, you're working your rear off until they get back. And I said, so there, there's some good and bads about everything. And I, but I think, you know, really, you know, you just got to find where your sweet spot is, what you really want to do and then drive to that. It's not always easy. Is it? No, no, it's, it's does, it, does it ever get really easy? No, I mean, I think I think right now for me, it's been pretty easy like the last probably decade because I've just had some of the best people working for me where you're not taking all the weight on yourself. And uh, in fact, the, one of the guys that's, you know, here locally that's in Wrench as well, uh, you know, Jeff Cox at Berkey's and I and I, he's the president. He used to work with me and he used to be my CEO and now he's the president. Of, that's kind of cool, too, to see your leaders kind of get up and move up in the organization. But, you know, he was like, trying to go, dude, Jeff. When you get the right people around you, your job will be easier. It's not going to be like completely work free or anything, but it'll be so much easier when you get good people around you that get their job done. You can rely on them, and, and they're they're smart. Like, I think that's what the mistake people make is they don't hire people smarter than they are. I mean that that's what I'm looking for the whole time. I go, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room yeah. in the interview, and go, hey, let's get this person here because man, I don't need to be the smartest guy in the room. I, I love to have people that are better than me at stuff and. And they, they come in and just kill it. And, you know, it's it's great. But you have they, that's what that's what most we all miss. Like a lot of the small guys, as you're growing and you're getting bigger and you have your own business, sometimes we kind of hire B players a lot, maybe some C players. And I always say the difference between an A player is like they leave and you want to cry. Yeah. A B player, you leave and go, oh, that stinks, but hey, I'll, I'll get somebody else. And a C player leaves, you're like, thank God, because I have to we'll fire you. So yeah. yeah, exactly. So that I think that's the thing is just trying to find those people that are really good at their job that you can rely on. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't only have to be IQ smart. It's just, man, some people just get stuff done. And that I love people like that, that you just go, Hey, let's just go get some stuff done. And they, and they get it done for you and you give it to them once. I think another thing is like in the one minute manager, they, they, they talk about the guy talks about not repeating himself. And I go, think about the velocity you lose when you sit there and have to say the fifth time, I should do that like the fifth time. 
But sometimes we get so busy that we just don't take the time to make it after the second time. What he would do is go, hey, I really don't like to repeat myself. I need you to pay attention and get this done and do it in a very, you don't have to yell and scream, just do it in a very succinct way. But I think that's a way to kind of get people to move in the right direction. And then if they don't, then you're just like, man, I was really clear about that. Let's move on. You know, you and Gus were on stage at an SGI conference. And I remember Gus talking, he says, when I bring somebody in, he says, I'll tell them, like, this is what I expect from you. Yeah. Can you do all this? And the guy either says, you know, yes or no. Of course, they want the job. They're going to say yes. He said, because now, now that you've said yes to this, if I ever have to come back and say, you're not doing this, we're just going to be talking about where you're going to work next. But there's, these are my expectations. Yeah. And I love that, not having to repeat your, look, this is what I expect from you. Can you do it? Yes or no? If you say, yeah, I'm going to hold you to it. If you tell me no, I want to know why. Why can't you do that? And, man. If you count how many times you repeat yourself in a day or a week about, hey, I do that. You know, you, know you, you just, it's like when you don't, if you just cut it in half, how much time it saves you, how much loss the company has. But the biggest problem with small, all small business, not just ours, all small business, is we hang on to people that shouldn't be there for like two years. And so one of the things I had a friend of mine say, because I was always the same way. I didn't want to let anybody go and, and that kind of thing. But one of my buddies said, he goes, look, they could be successful somewhere else. I go, they may not fit this mold here at Baker Brothers. But man, if they, they we, we could, not only are they wasting our time, but we don't, you don't think about you're wasting their time because they're going to work another two years and there's no way in heck they're, they're going to move, move up. up. Right. And, and it's like, that. So I think that's very, that's one of the things is that I could say now that I'm older, you know, is to go, I would probably let go of people faster as opposed to hold on to them or be very clear about it and, and sit down, take the time to go, Hey, I need you to do these things, get these done, or you're not going to have to worry about it. And, and the thing is, they don't, they'll come in and turn their keys and cards and stuff in and say, Hey, I couldn't get this done, Jimmy. And so those are the best things. And that's easy. You know, they're basically going to get fired, but they're quitting and it's, and it's pretty easy. So, I think that's that's a big thing for me is just to make sure like, hey, you know, that you move quick. If you want to move up, you just can't keep, you know, sometimes it's our fault. Like we sit there and go, gosh, I keep repeating myself. Hey, well, obviously you're not doing it the right way or you'd only say it once. And then people would go, oh, dude, you're serious about this. I need to get this done. And so I think I always tell people, I go, if you'll just sit there and go, I don't like you'll just tell them that you're disappointed what's going on and tell them what your expectation is and how hey, I need this done by this time. And it's either you get it done or you don't. I don't think it's always like a threat, like a bot getting fired or terminated, right. but it is just like, Hey, I need you to get this done. And, and, and then to sit down and go, you know, we keep having to recycle this. And I was like, Man, it's causing us velocity. Like I'm, I, we, I shouldn't have to even think about this anymore. We should get this done, move on to the next thing. But I, I will say that you can definitely make your life easier with, with the right people in place, you know, doing things that really have that want to get things done and things are going to happen and people are going to go through divorces and you know, bad times and, you know, family members dying. And those are hard to, they're, they're, it's hard for them to keep efficient, keep working at those times. And those are the times that, you know, but if you have to deal with all of that and just, I keep having to tell you over and over and over again, that that's where, you know, you start to, and I think we get used to it because there's, it's so hard to find the technicians and the plumbers. Uh, that sometimes we do put up with it. And then I was like, you got to, you have to put up with some of that on the, at that level, because there's just not a whole lot of them out there. So, but you can't, not in the office and not just doing the day to day, you know, the, the, the stuff that dispatchers and call center and the accountant and bookkeeping and all that. You just got to have people that get it done and you don't have to worry about it. And there's going to be problems, but I think that's the thing It's like, Hey, you know, you get people all on the same page, all on the same team, all head in the same direction, you know, our belief system, all this going this way. That's, I mean, that's why dad and I like decided that, you know, he said, Hey, I want to, you know, sell was because he wanted to stay flat because he was older. He didn't want to take on risk. And I was like pushing this way still. And he's, and we were really not in the same path. And he goes, Hey, I think it's time, you know, so but it, it, it all works out. And I, like I said, I think what I learned though over time and watching other companies is just that, having great people in place, you know, that are, you know, just get the jobs done. It makes your life so easy and makes your leadership so easy. And 
you know, just think about that. If you just like how, how easy it would be of being a parent, if you just only had to tell your kid one time, Hey, you're doing this wrong, do it this way. So it's, it's definitely great. So, so we have now been called Mario and Luigi. Uh, <laughs> probably so. I'm going to run out here and start the grill, but I heard you tell a story from stage one time. You had a technician who wanted to wear his own cap. Yep. One of your top technicians. And you told the story about how, you know, every time you'd see him, it'd be like, hey, you need to change the cap. You need to change the cap. And you walked out one day, and here he comes walking in. He's got on the wrong cap again. Uh-huh. He's like, oh, man, look, forgot. Uh, I'll take care of you. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. You're good. Just figure out where you're going to wear it next because you don't work here anymore. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes you do. you got to get rid of your best people. If you'll talk about that for a second, I'm just going to run out here and laugh the group. Okay. It's okay. hard to get rid of your top people sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes it's the only thing you, you have to do. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. Like if you're if you're being really fair with with everybody, you know, there there are things that I yeah, I had a guy one time go, Well, hey, we I need everybody to tuck their shirts in. And the guy goes, Well, do we do we really are we really gonna fire someone because they didn't tuck their shirt in? And then I told the guy, I go, Are they really gonna lose their job because they didn't tuck their shirt in? And and, and I asked that question because is it is it great enough to work here? Is it so awesome to work here that if I ask you to do something, you're just going to do it? You know, because if you love your job, you would tuck your shirt in 100% if I said, hey, you're going to lose it. So there, there's this fine balance of how, how, do we, how do we hold on to these guys that are so few and for, there's so few of them out there? How do we hold on to them? But at the same time, it's like I always say, I go, hey, the, t- the, the dog wags the tail. The tail doesn't wag the dog. <laughs> we need, there's a part of us that we have to have a level of control on quality, expectation for the customer, all those things. And if we're not willing to do it in a little way, and, and I you know, basically told, I told all my guys, I go, hey, look, when you go in a house, you're going to wear a Baker Brothers hat or you're not going to wear a hat. <laughs> I go, I don't care about Eastern Sun and Apex. And I was like, that's great. They're vendors. But I don't give it, I don't care about it being on your hat. And that's what the guy was like, well, I like this hat. I go, then I guess you better go put Baker Brothers on it because that's the only way you're wearing it. <laughs> there you go. Because the reason why was because I knew that when we came into people's houses, we'd go behind people and they know Joe came out, but they never knew the company name. And so everything I had had the logo on it, like my shirt, the hat, you know, every piece of paper. We did the, th- we did, we went ahead and paid extra for the color mm-hmm. because we wanted the color to be the same. And, and I'm telling you, and, and I think Gus Milestone does the exact same thing. Everything that he hands or, or they have on is Milestone. You bet. And so that's kind of that's kind of like, you know, hey, look, do you want to be on our team? You know, because I really don't care about the 49ers or the, the Chicago Bears or Atlanta fans. Braves. Like, yes. oh, hey, you like those hats? Great. You can wear them all you want when you're outside of here. But here at work, this is your uniform and this is what you're going to wear. It's part of it's part of your checklist. So sometimes we give up on certain little things like maybe it's the hat and well is it really that big a deal if we don't do the hat and it's really not about is it a big deal about the hat it's more about is about the culture about like hey are you willing to kind of let me lead you and let me put you in a good situation are you are you willing to be part of us you know and do things the way we do it because we do ask a lot of the guys that work for us and i'll be honest man the guys they do it. They they take care of it, and they and they take care of. You know, they'll wear the stuff, or they just won't wear a hat. I mean, and and we had we had we handed out a bunch of uh, water heater hats the other day from the you know the manufacturer, and and some of the guys and they were cool hats. Some of the guys had them on. I go, I know we gave these these two in a meeting, but you wear at home. But you got to wear Baker Brothers hats. Yeah. <laughs> I go so. You know, it, it's just I think there's just things that you have to kind of keep to to like manage the culture and everything else because it's not like we have control over everything they do but it is like hey i need you to do these certain things you know for these certain reasons and like i said most of the guys man they enjoy being part of a team uh, i was telling them, i want y'all to be proud to work here mm-hmm. and i want you to be proud of the guy that works next to you so that's something i think sometimes we don't understand is letting c players stay it, it messes the a players up because they're working and we've all done that we've worked hard and diligent and we're killing it and then here's this guy almost making us mad that he exists right and and it, and it does and, and so when you start it's funny you eliminate that c guy and you go in as a boss okay hey you know i think it's time for you to move on i'll tell you all those all those guys will come to you and thank you and tell you it, it was it should was, have done that a long time ago exactly yeah. exactly so there's a 
there's a funny joke that one of the guys that was a speaker at uh, SGI said that he used to be Zig Ziglar's a mentor, Chris Dunham. And Chris said, yeah, Mr. Ziglar would say, I don't know what we're going to do with without you, but tomorrow we're going to find yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so like that. That, that is, that's like a, that is something though for us is like, man, it's just making sure, man, get everybody on board, get everybody, you know, and, and I think I said this earlier and, if you can't get someone to do something as a leader, that, that reflects on you as a leader. So I tell my guys and managers, I said, man, if you can't get the guy to take a shirt in, like, doesn't that reflect on you? And, it, and it's not to be hard. Like, you can't just ask him to do it and he'll do it because he respects you. But if you don't have that, then you have to ask yourself, hey, am I putting enough emotional deposits in his emotional bank account. Am I doing enough good things? Good job. Hey, way to go. Hey, appreciation. Hey, thanks for working late the other day, man. You stayed till 10. You get you off early today or hey, you could come in late. You know, doing those things where you care about people and you put enough into them, then you cut some checks and I can ask some stuff of you. But if I'm like, you know, put a hundred bucks in and I ask a thousand dollars of emotional, that's going to be NSF and you're going to be, you know, bouncing checks. And what happens is if you can't get guys to do what you need to do, then you have to start reflecting on yourself and going, how good of a leader am I? What is my style? What do I need to change up? What do I need to do to get this done? You know, you know what we're talking today about tools you need to start a plumbing business. And Jason Smith put in put in another great tool to have as a plumbing code book. And we've listed a lot of tools. We've made videos in the past, what tools you need in your bag. But earlier in the podcast, you said you were the first person in the Dallas area with a sewer camera. Yes. Yeah, 1989. How big we, of an investment was that then? And it how was a lot. How easy was it to jump out and say, hey, this is a good deal? It, it, was, it was back then, it was $30,000. Dad had two cameras that he bought. And I was, I was a senior in high school, and he was telling me, he's like, yeah, I bought, I bought these sewer cameras. They're from... We're from uh, Germany, one's from Germany and one's from somewhere else. And they were in the Germany, the one from Germany was a prototype. And it was like, you know, it could go in a three inch, like, you know, two, two inch was tough. Three inch could go through three to four. Uh, the other one was a camera and it could go, it could go into like larger lines. So he had these cameras, but he, they were 30,000 a piece. So that was 60 grand back in 1989, which was a lot of money. So yeah, he really like where I was like in high school going, are you crazy? Like, you know, oh my gosh. I mean, I think my and, tuition and my tuition time, for school was four forty five hundred dollars for the Jesus. year. <laughs> yeah, but at the time he was only doing what three fifty around in there? Yeah, yeah. So he That's leased a big the, investment. Yeah. So he leased the cameras, like actually put them on an equipment lease and leased the cameras. So he'd go to that uh, the pumper show. It used to be back then it was in Nashville. I think now it's uh, maybe in Indianapolis or something yeah, like that. Well, but he went to that big pumper show and and man all that new stuff that was coming out was always want you know finding out about new things well i mean that's what propelled us into what he did like the leak location and the and the work for engineer engineers and like uh, consulting engineers uh insurance companies and that's what we did so all we were doing was that but i but i had more hours behind a camera because i was the only person that could use the camera and if you over you had to focus on it and if you over focused you had to send it to houston to get it fixed so it would be out for like two months if we if somebody messed with it. So basically, I had more time behind the camera and digging up what we what we had saw on the camera. Go okay, we had to dig that up. Um, and so I knew. I mean, when all the cameras started to be pretty prevalent, it was funny. I probably had thousands and thousands of hours behind one. And and somebody go, oh, that's a crushed line. I go, no, that's just a combination. That's just a, that's just this this fitting because. Yeah, I thought it was crushed line too. I dug it up and I was like, no, oh, hey, oh, look at all this. This is so bad. And I go, hey, jet the line and then go look at it again. And you'll, you'll find out that there's, you know, cast iron gets so much buildup on it. So I, I think really, you know, yeah, having a camera is a great idea. I think if you're going to do home service type work, I mean, I think any, almost anything is great because what we always wanted to do, we, we would do like a free, so people used to charge for the camera. Right. I remember. Well, we would just, we, would, we, always, we started doing that gosh, in 2003 going, hey, let's just do the camera for free. What we'll do, because see, if we go in there and they're stopping up for a reason beyond, hey, it was just paper towel or hand wipes or whatever, you don't, you'll not know that. And then if you go in there and go, oh, you've got a big, you know, root penetration underneath your slab. Well, now we just went, like, I would have never seen that if I said, hey, $300 more to, to, to do that because right. you'd have bowed out. But every person we go in there because we go, hey, let's find out what it is tell them a repair and a cost estimate, even though we got them cleared, the next time they stop up, 
they may they may call us. And we used to charge a lot for drain cleaning. And they, or people go, oh my gosh, I was drain cleaning. It was like twice as much as the guy who came out. And I said, well, and that's because, oh, you, you didn't give us the camera for free. I go, no, what happens is when we go in there, we see what's going on. So we don't knock a tiny hole in the roots. And we have to go in there and clean that out. <laughs> I go, and it takes longer. And if you want us just to run a, a snake and pop it, sure, man. So it's 120 it's, bucks. So it's it goes down, we're done. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you want to go in there and clean it right, I go, it's going to take, it's going to take some money. It takes some time. So that, that's kind of, you know, the, I think a camera is a big thing. And, of course, drain cleaning equipment. Um, and, you know, people all have their favorite. Um, I mean, we used General for years. I had guys that were Spartan guys. I was like, oh, my gosh, if I don't have a Spartan. Corlets. Everybody's got a different brand. Everybody's got what, you know, Corlets. Like, they have the brand that they love. Um, I think cameras, like, I don't know. Uh, I saw in the shop house in Milwaukee's. I haven't tried those or seen those. We always used Rigid. Rigid. We had Rigid back, like, to tell you how far back. It used to be, it was called Sea Snake. Well, Sea Snake was actually the company that Rigid bought to, to make the cameras I met today. all those people at the last show. Yeah, the, the, the one yeah. In, and then so so we had I don't know I think we still have those cameras like we have like three of them and we have like number it's like 36 37 and 40 serial numbers like wow. so we had some of the first of those before it was you know rigid and so yeah it's I mean we know a lot about the cameras a lot about you know how they work and unfortunately I was always having to take them apart and fix them and try to fix them myself and do all these things so but that's a, I think a very important part I think jetting is another one uh, if you're going to get really into drain cleaning, you know, having a jetter, like having a good jetter, um, and and then there's a bit, and there's there's something to learn about jetters too. It's really gallons per minute is an important part of a jetter because a lot of times people just look at the PSI and they're like, okay, well I have three thousand psi or twenty four hundred or whatever, but gallon per minute flow is important because especially if you're doing cast iron, you knock all that, you knock all the crust off and get it down to rinse it out, to rinse it out with a yeah. with a low gallon per minute. It'll take you hours. To get one that, like, you know, we have a big U.S. chair. It has, like, I think it's, like, 8.5 gallons a minute. It will, We can throw it down in there and pull it back one time, and you're done. I mean, it's, that's a whole other world. Now, we had another one that was the smaller, and we were sitting there just pulling it, pulling it, push it back in, pull it back out, and then you're just building stuff up. You can actually create a stoppage because oh, all that – got to get all that stuff to the city, and it's so hard to get down there. So I think getting, you know, it just depends on what you're going to go into or what you feel like you're going to be doing. You know, if you're going to be doing a lot of like, you know, sewer drain cleaning work, I mean, I think that's a good way to go because there, there's big jobs that happen in those. You know, you go out and do, you know, a two or three hundred dollar unstop. I mean, you could be on a twenty thousand dollar job or a hundred thousand dollar job. I exactly. It's yeah. like, wow. Yeah. And you know, they think, well, my drain's just clogged. Yeah. What I love about the cameras is you can just show them, look, it's not just a clog. Yes. And. You know, the camera's one of the first ones. There's a guy out by you, Scott Odell, mm -hmm. for camera repair. And this guy, I used to go out and rent cameras, and that was back when I was charging for them, because I'd book two or three camera calls, and they go rent a camera, come back and run all three of them, and then get him the camera back before 8 o'clock the next morning when he opened. Yeah. And eventually, it's like, man, I just I need my own camera. That way, I could do it every time I cleaned a drain. And I think the first time I heard that y'all were doing it, I'm not charging that minute. It's nice. Then it's like, wait a minute. Really, if I put that camera on my truck, why not? It look what it does. Look what it lets me show the customer. It's a marketing opportunity. Like every single one you go on, and it's a good, it's a plus for the customer. So it's like kind of this thing, like, oh, it's good for us. I go, yeah, but it's good for the customer because if I get you unstopped and let you know that, hey, you've got like a four thousand dollar problem, you know, maybe you can afford it then, or maybe it's not a good time for you then. But you know, it's there, so you can, you can, you know take care of it when it's time to take care of it. So I, th I think that's the big part is like, you know, I always told the guys that I said, man, it's important to let these customers know, hey, what they're in for. You have somebody that comes and they go, oh, I'm going to retire at this house. You know, they're in their 60s or 70s. And they're like, hey, they're going to cart my dead body out of this house. We love this house. And I'm like, hey, go find you a house built pre-1980. <laughs> like, you know, be like get you one 1985. has all PVC because – you live in a house that's 1970 and all this is cast iron and it, and it is not if it's when yeah. and all this. And I go, look, the most expensive thing in plumbing that goes up more than anything else, not water heaters, not it's digging. Digging costs more and more. I mean, I don't think most of the guys even going to shovel off their truck for un, under a thousand dollars now. <laughs> I go, it's just, they, I mean, like that hard labor stuff is just, you know, what what's going up the most. So, 
Yeah, I think I think for me, it's like, hey, let them know, you know, let them know where they're at, let them know what's going to happen, and that way, you know, they they know what to expect. But yeah, for tools, I mean, I think steering machine cameras are like must, and you know, drain all kinds of drain equipment. And I'll tell you this, and I think that's one thing about tools that are very important. I can be the best, most knowledgeable plumber ever. But I, you know, you go over to your buddy's house and they go, oh man, can you look at this real quick? And you look at it and you go, oh yeah, we need to tighten that up. Or we need to do something. I can fix it real quick. And they, and they give you those little tiny pliers and like, you know, a, a flathead screwdriver. And you're over there like, okay, you know, I just brought a knife to a gunfight. You're like, yeah. there's no way. I go, it doesn't matter how much experience you have. If you don't have a basin wrench, you are not going to get this thing tightened up. I mean, and, and I think that's what the important thing is you need to be very effective and efficient. You need to have the tools, you know, like one of my guys, man, he has a ton of tools and he has a tool, like the tool is, you know, to pull certain, certain stems. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and you go, but it takes him like minutes compared to if you don't have that tool an hour. You know, somebody asked about a mulling cartridge earlier. I remember the first time I tried pulling one without a cartridge remover. I fought that thing for an hour and a half. I ended up getting a three-quarter inch drill bit, drilling the insides out, then going on with the saw and trying to trim it and not mess up the valve. And I did it. And then I found out about that tool and it took 15 minutes the next time. I'm like, man, what the heck did I just do? Oh, yeah. Uh, good friend says, so do you know any good apprenticeships or trade schools in the United Kingdom? And I don't. Uh, you know, I'm pretty good with Texas, but once it gets out of te outside of Texas, I can't help you out a lot there. Uh, pop it up, Plumbing Elbow says, young bucks will need old timers wisdom. Can't use wise and young in the same sentence. Yeah, you're pretty close to right there. Uh, Sean says, I'll, I'll always be young. My buddy just might not agree with me. <laughs> I know the feeling there, Sean. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about mentorships and groups and growing and coaching and different things like that. What would you recommend to somebody that, you know, we're, we're talking about getting tools to start their own company. What advice would you give somebody that is wanting to start their own company today? I always tell them about the organizations, the coaches, the consulting, the training. We've talked about SGI, Certain Path, Nextar, uh, Nation, Nations Roundtable. There's so many groups out there to help. For a smaller company just starting out, what, what would you recommend? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to be a part of those just to skip some steps because that, that's what the whole key of those organizations are. That's always say in certain in certain path was just, hey, let's just we got to skip steps. That, and, and, and you just need to like because we, we overthink certain things like, you know, even what kind of tools to put on the truck. You know, sometimes we overthink a lot. And it kind of freezes, us up, freezes you up like you're just so analytic. You're so analyzing the situation, trying to be perfect. That look, you, there's a part you just go, okay, this is going to be imperfect, but you know what? I'm going to make mistakes. We're going to mess it up. But we're going to fix it, and I'm just not going to make the same mistakes over. But the thing is, you know, I think I think a lot of people, I've had people come to certain, and they tell me, they go, hey, my mistake was I didn't sign up for this early, sooner. Once they get in, they go, I came to one, you know, about three years ago and decided not to do it. And I was like, okay. So, and I'll tell my story. I go, well, I have this bad story where, hey, we did like, you know, $3 million, you know, in 2005. And we kept here, and then now we do. We're gonna break a hundred. I go look. Being in that organization had a lot to do with that to help us. We didn't have to think about stuff. We just go, hey, here's a budget. Here's the PNL. Here's what all this. Here's what this tells us to do. Yeah, I mean, here's what you need in your PNL, like you on QuickBooks or whatever. You just upload what they have. You don't. You're not recreating the wheel. So I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we feel like that we have to be innovators, and you don't. You should copy what people do and, and put your name on it, and it's completely and totally fine. I'm not telling you to mess with trademarks or anything, but I'm just saying if, if somebody goes, hey, here's my form, and you go, well, could, could I use that form for your service agreements? Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, sure. Then slap your logo on it and take off, and you don't have to think about it and type it up and figure it all out yourself. Have you ever heard of Tommy Mello? Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's a garage door guy. Yep. Uh, he's in that. He does $180 million a year. I got to hear him speak at uh, Nations or Service Nations Roundtable Nation this last week. And I've heard it before through Dave Jinks, who helped Gary Keller write the one thing. But Tommy calls it r and It's not research and development. It's rip off and do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the neat thing about being able to talk to you and Gus and different people 
is, hey, here's what we do. Here's how we do it. Here's our form. And you look at it. When I first got to SGI, I didn't know what KPIs were, didn't know how to build a budget, did not know. I mean, I understood flat rate pricing or upfront pricing, but never understood it like I did once I got into a book, straightforward pricing and then learning why and the numbers and you know, plug in your hourly rate and how to figure that hourly rate. There's so many things I didn't know and understand that once I got into it, I was like a sponge. Like, oh my gosh, look at all this. But you just had to do it. Like just thinking about what hour and you go, okay, let's go get this flat book, like flat rate book. Let's put an hourly rate in there. And you don't know which hour, hour how do I do that? Da, 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 blah, 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 blah. And you just go in there and they just go, hey, you do this times five, there you go. And then you're done. So I'll tell you right now, we could think about that for a week and probably not come up with the right yeah. answer. But it's just like, hey, here's the formula. Here's how you do it. Now you're on the next thing. And I think what's funny is you're talking about the when I first got into certain path back when it was, it was actually PSI at the time. So I'm in there. I'm young. And I, I'm probably in my early 30s. And here's all these guys. They're in their 50s and you know, 60s. And you know they're all in that room going, hey, we're, you know, have signed up for this. And they're talking to us kind of in our in orientation. Or I guess they called it EA. And basically, they go, everybody raise your hand. Like, everybody put their hand up because you definitely do your books at least once a year to do taxes. So if you're not doing them once a year, you need to talk to us immediately because <laughs> like, you're not paying taxes. <laughs> so raise your hand. Everybody raise their hand. Everybody put it down if you do it, like, you know, biannually. You know, at least biannually. Most everybody put their hand down, like half the room. Then they go, how about quarterly? Then me, there's two of us. And I'm talking to hundred people that own companies that were doing monthly, you know, reporting. You bet. And so the problem is if we don't do that, you can't fix like you can't fix what's broken. Like you just keep so if you so say in January you had something messed up in there, say you're paying too much for you know materials or whatever, or there's some anomaly. Well, you, if you do it excellently in the middle of February, you can go, oh, oh, what's happened here? here? Let's fix that problem. If you don't do that. It could be three months, four months before you happen to catch it or going over packing slips and stuff like that. You happen to catch it, but you can catch stuff so fast and fix things that are broken by, by just using your PL, by just using the financial statement. And like my dad, I mean, we don't, we did the poor man's financial statement. We grabbed our, you know, ledgers. Yeah. But our, our statement, like, you know, we took yeah. our statement and literally looked at our statement and go, Oh, we made that much. We, we wrote checks for that much. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, forgot we're still haven't paid all the bills from that month because it ended the 25th and we we're still paying bills, mm -hmm. you know? So, so it's this, you, know, you, you got to have a way to like be able to find the issues and problems and fix them. And then, and not just be trying to fix everything. Cause we would sometimes just blindly go and try to fix all material. And I was telling one time my dad, I said, dad, we're over here killing ourselves on material. And we got an organization. We found out that a one lowest per material percentages of anybody that I talked to across the country. And, and, but that's what my dad and we thought that was our holy focus, but our labor percentage was out. And I was like, Dad, that's not the problem. We've been we've been working to this problem. This is the problem over here. Let's fix that. So that that's kind of what I think you have to do. Why you need to get an organization and learn how to budget? Because like I was telling you, most of the time it's a technique. We're a technician getting into business. It's a technician getting into business. Well, we know how to price. You know, we know how much it costs. We know how to buy stuff. But the problem is. We don't know the business side. So those organizations, what they do, they're our college, they're our business school. We're learning how to do budgeting, forecasting, like, you know, hey, what are you going to do next year? Well, if you have more dollars you want to do, you also need more people. So it's it's the kind of the cycle of, hey, we're learning about business and how to do it. And then we and once we master that, then we, then we have a chance at being successful because having your own business at 10 years is a one in 10. Like it's, it's a 10% proposition. Yeah. Like they say the first, you know, 50% of the people fail in the year and yada, 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 after 10 years, about 10% make it 10 years. And I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's hard and you need help and you don't need to just kind of be blindly trying to figure it out on your own. That's why there's so many, so much failure. But I, I'd be honest, I think in our industry now with all the things that everyone knows, I bet you the percentages are a lot better than they used to be because now you're a business person. You're not just out doing calls and running around. So I think, I think that's the big thing is, Hey, you got to figure out, you know, how do I make money? Am I charging enough? You know, cause if you're just living 
you don't, I always tell my guys, I go, you don't want to live paycheck to paycheck as a like business. If, if your business is living paycheck to paycheck, then if you're just this close, on Friday, everybody racing to the bank to get their checks oh, no. cashed. And I've two of them are going to get I've it. worked for companies like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, cash flow is a problem. You know, we don't, a lot of times in new construction and stuff, we let people carry us out like 120 days. Well, I mean, you have a very small profit margin. Well, let's go to the bank and, and we'll get a we'll get a line of credit. And so what we do is go to the bank and get a line of credit, and then we pay our guys and pay our material. And we're paying the five percent out to the bank. So you're really well, not now money. it's yeah. not five percent. Yeah. You know, back in the day when it was cheap, but now it's higher. It's eight percent, and now we're we're losing. We're, we're actually at a negative profit because we're paying it to the bank because of just the collection that we do, the cash flow. So cash flow is so important. And it's like, and look, we're in a shortage. Dude, you you tell some guy that you know that works for a builder, like DR Horton, they go, oh, what do you, oh, I'm a plumber. Dude, he will 100% corner you and go, hey, look, man, he wants you to come work for him. Yeah. But, you know, so there's a shortage, but yet we'll still let people hold us out like that. So the smart guys don't. They, they're like, hey, man, we get done. You're going to pay me. Hey, you're going to get, done. everybody asks us if we do commercial. It's funny. And I go, yeah, they go, well, I don't, I don't see you do a lot of commercial. I go, yeah, because we go, who's going to pay us? Mm -hmm. Where's the check? Do you have a credit card? We'll take a credit card. And it's funny, a lot of those guys are like, oh, well, you know, they don't want to do that. And it's like, well, then we're not going to come out because I've got another call that's going to be on the books where I'm going to go out there. And when I get done, they're going to pay me. I said, it's just like McDonald's. I never went and got a Happy Meal or got a, you know, number three and said, hey, guys, I'll come back next week and give you all the money. You pay for it right then. So I think I think that's what we have to realize because there's a shortage of, of workers and construction in general and construction companies that do what we do, that we don't put up with those standards anymore. And when we stop putting up with them, see, when the market says no one will allow you to pay 90 days out, that's when it stops. Yeah. But they, And I think that's where we're at is everyone's so educated and doing what we do now. That they're, they've understood that, hey, we're not allowing that anymore. So, uh, and you know, if you've got a good partner, because a lot of times you do GCs and all that stuff, mm -hmm. if you're in a partnership, whether you want to be or not, you should consider it as you're looking to get the job that you're going to be in a partnership because that's where we get hurt so that the economy goes to, you know, poo, that GC goes down. Well, he hadn't paid us yet. And that's where a lot of problems happen, I guess, what back in the 80s here locally. So, I remember one of my best friends. We talked about him speaks plumbing out of Garland. I remember him telling me when I first heard out, he said, never take on a job so big that if you lost it, it would put you out of business. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you, you take on this $5,000, $10,000, $50,000 job. And yeah, it, in commercial, it's a lot easier for that to happen. Yeah. And, and that's why most of these organizations teach you, like, if you're not doing residential service, why not? Like you said, you get paid that day. You can train your people. It's a little bit more specific, and I love that. And then specialized in certain things, leak detection, having cameras, having leak detection equipment, stuff like that. And j just so y'all know, I'm probably not going to go back out to the grill. I'm having too much fun here. Uh, and I'm not opening up the safe today because I may open it up just to show you. This, this is my bourbon and tequila safe. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, that's Yeah, we probably should open that. <laughs> and if you want a drink, I, can, I will not have a drink today. I give you my word. Uh, Man, after 48 hours without food, I don't think bourbon is what I need right no. now. No. Uh, I got a super chat from Don Shrew. I appreciate that. It says, what are, you, what are your views on a tech that starts a small business, zero employees, taking all the and doing all the work and bookkeeping, bookkeeping, making max profit versus expanding into multiple trucks and teams? I'll let you take that one first. What, what are your ideas? Because, I mean, and I don't know, did your dad start out as one truck? Just, hey, I'm, I'm yeah. working the company. I mean, he was, he was a good. truck and a helper, you know, pretty much. And, I, you know, to be honest, that was, I think we talked about that earlier too. Like, yeah, my dad had the, you know, the, the, tr the TV tray out and he was writing bills out and invoicing. And, you know, if, if you can, if you can manage it, most of the time, I always say, and I think I said that in the podcast, they go, most of the time, the biggest mistake they, get, they don't have somebody answering the phone that's good. Because you're getting your pay, like if you're not, if you're, it depends on what kind of work you're doing. If you're doing residential service, you're doing advertising and paying money to get people to call you. If you're not handling those calls very well, you're letting money flow out the door. It's the biggest mistake guys make is they use their cell phone and they're answering their cell phone while they're, you know, feet on the ground. 
and they're missing all kinds of opportunities. But you, I will tell you this, there's, there's a point that you'll be turning some of your customers away. So when we have a big company, what, how we beat a dude that's working like that is that you get three weeks out and we could come out today. And everybody goes, well, these are my customers and they're your customers until you don't answer the phone. They're your customers until you don't, you're not available to them. And then I get that work. So, so the thing is, it, it is kind of almost because of the demand. It's kind of hard to almost do that. And I'll be honest, it is tough to get other trucks going. And, uh, but if you have a great, like what I would do is get a great call center office slash office manager. A lot of guys, what they do is they, they marry a really, really smart lady. It might not be that smart because they talk her into being that person. But you also, and that was something else I used to say to the SGI. If you're going to do that, don't go, well, hey, I make 80 grand or 100 grand. You know, no. If you have both of you doing it, you're making 50 and 50. Yeah. Don't let that happen. Make sure you're making, that she's making the money that she needs to, and you're making the money you need to. But just one person in the office and three trucks, you can, you can, you know, if you want to stay small, I think everybody should stay what makes them feel comfortable. But I will say this, if you're up in an attic putting a tankless water heater in the middle of summer and somebody calls you on that phone and you're you answer it, move. you're going to say something Why? horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, Why? I can't and, right and, and you could just, they could be giving you this huge, great job you bet. and you're being a jerk. So it's just hard to work, I think, and answer the phone. That's the biggest one. The other part too is, man, you know, now there's a lot of automation now. And if you could be automated, like dad was an automated, he was like handwriting everything. There's a lot of automation out there. So if you can automate, I, I would say that, yeah, if you, if you could just go, Hey, it's on my, you know, here's my phone, click, click, click. We're done. We got paid. We're done. You know, that, that could happen. But you know, if, as long as you're not doing working too hard, I mean, you know, it's funny as they say that when we go out on a truck on our own as a technician, that we, that we basically cut our hourly in half and, and they go, what? And it's like, well, you make kind of the same amount of money. You just work twice as long. You work at 80 Absolutely. hours instead of 40. And so I think you just be careful about that. Pay attention to how many hours, you know, that you spend and, and what is your, what is your pay? And are you getting paid enough? The other part too is I always say that when you have a problem with someone, I go, man, we're, we have this little problem. We're talking about a, I don't know, a $70 problem. And, and three of us are talking about it for like an hour. I go, we just spent the $70. Let it go. You know, pay, pay. I used to tell my dad that he's always going to try to, you know, scrap everything out in the back. And I go, and he's making like $300,000 a year. And he's back there. Oh, I'm going to scrap this stuff. And, stuff. and I go, okay, dad. And he goes out there and, and man, I'm like, dad, do you know how much just, if we sold it the way it is, if you took your hours and divided by how much money you make, do you understand that you're at loss? Like not just giving it to them and let them scrap it. But I think that's kind of a big part of it. Man, man make sure that you're hourly, not driving yourself crazy. You know, it's tough, like, if, you, if you're a smaller business, like, and you're competing with lot larger companies. See, that's the problem is there's more 50 and $100 million companies in all these markets. It's an evolution that's happened. Mm -hmm. And it's the most that's ever happened across the country, 100%. You know, large companies were somebody that did $25 million. Now it's like, you know, there's, there's a that's guy in level. Phoenix 200. I'm yeah. like, good gosh. So, you know, it's, it's like. Th this has happened, but you're competing against those guys. So the, the thing is, you're trying to compete with market share. So you have to have a strategy that you can compete with these big guys or they're just blanketed in the whole entire DFW Metroplex like here. Now, how do I just carve out my piece? And so that's the strategy is like, hey, how do I how do I do this? How do I do it on a community level? You know, do I become, you know, one of the suburbs, just a guy and, and I just try to be their plumber? You know, I think there's a lot to that. So that, that's something else too, is you can get super efficient, you know, by yourself, overhead wise, you know, you know, just, I mean, make sure you, know, you got medical insurance and stuff like that. Like whatever you had working at a company, at least make sure you have all that stuff too. I mean, that, that's a mistake people make too. And one, one thing that I like about it too, when you start out as yourself, th these groups, these organizations we're talking about, and you may not be able to get in at, at one truck. It may be like, look, I can afford that. But if you can now you get to learn and implement the systems and processes. You get to learn to use the price book when it's just you. You're not trying to come teach me how to do it so I can teach my three plumbers how to do it. If you can learn to do that, now when you do bring somebody on, they ride with you, you train them, you show them, this is how we do things. And this is the only way we do it. So I, th I think they say that. to join, like a lot of those guys, especially the ones that you have to pay a good amount of money to be in, I think, I think, you know, they, they like to be, you to be over like 600, you know, five to 600. 
but you know, like a million, you know, that, that way you're kind of like, you know, they, they also understand like, Hey, we could break you if you don't have, if you don't yeah. have the money to do it, you know, we could break you with these fees and dues and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think you just, you just really have to get a part of something or even, even just getting with somebody, you know, successful. Like one of the things that happened with us here locally is um, Gus Antos has milestone, you know, electric plumbing air AC now, but initially it was just he did electric, we did plumbing and he was a smart guy. And then we, we collaborated daily and, and work through stuff. So that's another way you get someone who's not in direct competition with you, but you know, is kind of ahead of you. Exactly. And then you can kind of, you know, let, you know, help them mentor you and talk about, you know, where they'll be honest, you know, cause a lot of times in, if, if we're in the same market, sometimes people aren't honest about things. I've always been really honest because I feel like if we raise level overall competition, that's good for all of us. Exactly. And and I and I really do. And, I, and I'll tell guys all the time. They go, well, man, I can't believe. It. I mean, I'm right down the street from you guys, and you're literally telling me how you do everything. And I go, well, the other thing too is, I know you're a plumber and you're hard headed like I am, and you probably won't do half of what I tell you, or you won't do anything that I tell yes. you. So I can give you the instruction book, and you decide if you want to do it a different way. I go, it's fine, but I do I do think that's you know important. You know, if you're starting a business. You've got to get as much information and intel as you can to try to be successful because it is hard. Things happen. I had a perfect business one time being a partner, and it was like, man, there's no way this could fail. You know, things happen. You got he got ALS, you know, and, and it's like, hey, we, you know, you have to. There's just things that happen. We had one guy. He 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 was going to give us this contract when he retired. I mean, you know, it's it doesn't matter how good you are. Sometimes it doesn't matter because life happens. The other variables happen. So. Just, you know, it's, it's tough. And so, but whatever makes you feel comfortable, I think that's the thing. Like if I just like working by myself and that's what I want to do, I can control what I do. I like to do excellent, perfect work. Hey, I, I charge more for it. So I don't ever really get that far behind. And there's a, there's a beauty to that. And I think you just find your sweet spot in life and then go after your sweet spot because I told you this earlier too. I go, man, there's times I would not have wished my job on anybody <laughs> that like my worst enemy, I wouldn't wish it on him at certain times. I mean, for, and I'm not talking like, Hey, this is a bad day or a bad month. I'm talking like a year of me just going, yes. why am I doing this? This is terrible. There's so much, but once you learn and find out, you know, now I, I forget like stuff I know that's just second nature that, you know, you get around like that. He's, he asked about something I'm like, yeah, that I thought that was important too. I was right where you were. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. I heard a story about you when tank plus water heaters first came out. Uh-huh. Y'all went out for like 2,000 things with water heaters and had a, a real low price to install them and said, look, we're going to learn to do tankless water heaters better than anybody else. We didn't do Pretty the, true or no? We didn't buy 2,000. Okay. I'm just <laughs> well, going to hey, the, 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 oh, the rumor grows. <laughs> Next year I'll be saying, I heard you bought 40,000 tankless water heaters. No, but what we did, now I will say in Sonoma again, we might have bought 2,000. We, we bought as many well, as we possibly yeah, could. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is what we did is we, it was funny. So what I, we started doing radio ads and what I tried to do is I, I saw my dad, I go, if we should put out there, Hey, who, who needs a plumber? And, and of the 350,000 people listening to the station, we're probably talking to that many. If you need a plumber, if I go, Hey, who hates to wait on hot water? I'm talking to 80% of people on home. So we started, we actually were doing the Grunfoss comfort system that, 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 you know, research the wow. retrofit recirculating system. Uh -huh. Loved it. So I was like, okay, let's put those in. So we started. So what I was doing was like, Hey, we're creating demand by putting something out there that the, that the people don't know exists to solve a problem. So we're doing that. Well, what happened was inadvertently we got into tankless business because people were like, Hey, I heard about this instantaneous hot water heater that never runs out of hot water. They were calling in just, crossing the wires of the of the communication yeah. and they were like it's well, not what you said it's what they heard my plumber won't do it and i'm like well we'll do it absolutely and so what we did it was we, we went put one in it was like and it was hard difficult retrofit and it was all these things that we had to do that were not normal stuff that we did and we did things like that you know having to upgrade the gas system having to you know mm -hmm. do gas sizing just to make sure that you had enough btus to handle it so what happened was i just go here's what we're going to do we're, we're going to do them for twenty three ninety five. They were like eight hundred dollars a heater, and I go, we're going to do them for twenty three ninety five. And we went out and sold these twenty three ninety five heaters, and did them exactly what we were supposed to do them. And if the first one we did took a day and a half, so you didn't make money on all of them. No, but what we did was <laughs> we're like we're like, hey, look, here's what we're going to do. 
Yeah, and I'll explain something else too about the tankless water here. It's like blows your mind. We go, we're going to get good at them. And so then we got to where we're putting them in six hours from a day and a half to six hours. Yes, because the guy, we sent the same guy, Jay Jarvis, and he just did it, did them, did them, did them, found every little thing that we'd, every scenario we'd run across. And then we train the next guy and somebody else goes with him. Then somebody else goes with him and then you start training them and then we're, and then we're selling them, but we were making money on 2395. And so something else too, that everybody gets messed up on tankless water here is they start using all these percentages and I laugh and I go, look, there's a lot of equipment, right? A lot of, uh, there's a lot of costs and material costs. I was like, if a guy made gross margin dollars, they don't look at it on a gross margin basis. They do a percentage basis. Well, hey, I got to do 50%. So we're going to charge $6,000 for them. And you're like, okay, you're not going to sell any because nobody's going to buy it for $6,000 because the tank to tankless differential, that's what you're doing. Different. It's too far away. You got to get it closer together. So if I can get it closer together, I'll, I'll sell more tankless. I was telling somebody, I said, so what if one of your guys runs all day, what is this? What are the gross margin dollars he brings back into the company? And they go, well, if he runs all day, you know, I'll get like eight or $900. I said, well, a four thousand dollar tankless, he brings in two thousand. So you're telling me that he's bringing in two trucks of gross margin dollars for you. to your company, but it's not fifty percent. But it's but but it's only forty percent thing or a thirty percent thing. So so I'm like, man, the amount of money that you that you're giving up on to charge six grand or seven grand or however much, you'll never sell them. So it's like you have to find that sweet spot in everything in life. And I think that's one of the things. It's like, hey. Let's let's see how many dollars come into the company, and and, and how much I can leverage because we, we have a hard time finding the guys, so we need to figure out how to make every guy in the truck the most effective as possible. And so I have guys that only do water heaters. That's all do the water heaters. They 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 crush it. Like two guys in a truck in one year can do a million dollars, just selling water heaters. Two guys in one truck, and I go I. I've only had one guy in service this last year break a million dollars who does big jobs and all this other stuff. It's the only guy I've ever had run his own truck, do all of his own work and break a million dollars. And I'm like, but they, the, the water here guys, they've been doing it. Half of them have been doing it the whole entire time. So it's, it's how do we leverage the jobs and leverage the cost and make sure that we're bringing the most money into the business that that's healthy, not discounting because not to discount for the sake of, just kind of to actually make money and, and figuring out a way to do it, which is Gus is if he was listening, this would die because he's just like, hey, have a good price, have a good price. But efficiency, like what our water heater group does, we are so efficient at it. So you think of a tech goes out to a water heater and it's up in the attic. Oh, I got to call in. I may not have water in my truck. I got to get the water heater. I got to call in for a help. I got to da 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 five six hours. I've, Looked at them years and years, five to six hours of that job. My guys, they're all ready to go. They've got everything. They got the guy. Two hours, three hours, a whole different ball game. So we're through, and then the volume creates an efficiency for us on the tank. And it's just we're we're getting this whole thing going and it's creating this, you know, creating this efficiency. So we are one of the lower prices in town. Like I would almost say that we are one hundred percent the cheapest in town. And then, but. We all, but through our efficiency, not through us getting killed, being cheap, right? But the efficiency in the way we do. So that I think that's kind of a. Okay, so somebody just starting out their first tools. The camera was such a big deal, mm-hmm. and I, I love that your dad's like the first one. Hey, I don't know if I could afford sixty grand. Matter of fact, I'm just taking it away. <laughs> uh, but but somebody starting out today, if somebody wanted to walk out and start their own company tomorrow. I'll start it tomorrow, it's extra Sunday, maybe wait till Monday. But if someone to walk out and open their own company, it'd be different than everybody else. Because, uh, you know, I love talking to about you. You do a lot of things different. Uh, I've heard you on stage, talked to you in person. I remember the first time I ever walked into SGI at the time, I sat down at the round table because I saw you and I'm like, actually, no, I didn't even see you at the time. But I walked in, there was two chairs open. I sat down, the empty one on the right. And I had all my shirts at the time. It's the Texas Green Plum. You're like, man, I see your trucks everywhere. And I, I turn and look, and, and I see the, the Baker Brothers, and it's Jimmy Dale. And guys, this is the most popular plumber in Dallas because he's on he's on TV, I think, every channel every morning. Probably not, but 
And, and I love the fact that every commercial y'all do ends in two words. Crazy. Mm-hmm. And that is phenomenal. But when I sat down as a little bitty company getting into this big organization, and the guy next to me says, I see your truck <coughs> And you look over at this GP and you're like, dude, I see your trucks everywhere. You're everywhere. That was me. But if you could talk to somebody just getting in, and we've talked about a lot of different tools. We've talked about a lot of different training and tools. What tools would you tell somebody to get that is going to make their job easier <clears throat> and, and help them do well just starting out? Well, you know, like, like I was talking about, just technology is one. I mean, just having a even a point of sale system, which they call point of sale system, like normally like, hey, you walk into a store and they've got like, you know, a register. Um, you know, have it on your phone or iPad, you know, having those, having the ability to conduct a transaction, enter that into accounting without having to physically enter it in. Those tools, software and technology can really, really super be helpful. Um, that's probably you know, also just books, like getting information like books or like you're listening to this or just podcasts about you know business strategy leadership strategy i mean i think those are tools that are necess- a necessity if you want to have you know several trucks hey hey how do we do that and how how do we lead well how do how do we get the result we want you know and then i think another one too oh thank you another one too is just you know um you know just the the standard tools like you know having a great truck like you know having a good logo having a good name i think i think people really do the worst job of naming their companies um, we, our company name is Baker brothers and, and the Baker brothers were not actually related to my family. It was like they, my grandfather and the Baker brothers were buddies and they basically gave the company more or less to him because they did rotor to franchise those five States. And so they had, you know, they had to like separate. So he basically, you know, just paid them referral fees and things like that. But, you know, we kept the name because the, the, but it's a, it is a good name because Baker's not a name that you use all the time. So always when you're trying to like figure out a name, it's always great to like use and use something that everyone can read. You know, if somebody has like a freaking five syllable name that's you know from German descent. I mean, the average guy here in America can't read it, but anyone can look and see Baker. So I want I want to say that using words that we don't use all the time, but are simple, or another thing, having signage on your truck and and having you know going ahead and spending the money to wrap your truck. That that's an important thing. Don't put too much stuff on the truck. That's one of the biggest mistakes everybody makes. They put, I want to put everything that I do in plumbing down on this big long so paragraph. And then and then basically no one reads it and it's too wordy. And if you notice our trucks, we have a, a faucet, a big huge faucet on it because we, we wanted y'all to look like to see, like graphic, a graphic on it. And if it's a lady, a dog, or whatever, like Gus has a lady and a baby on there. But it's something where you look at it and go, oh, what's that? Then Logo, phone number, website, and that's it. And, and we don't, and we don't, I mean, you can tell we do plumbing you bet. at the time. And you can t- now you, it says, our logo says Baker Bros Plumbing, plumbing, air, electric underneath. You know what we do. You see the big faucet, you get it. You don't have to, but, but the thing is, make, make it simple and clean because what you're looking for is you're looking for when that person drives around. If you just have a white truck, you're making a big mistake. You're like your wife, my wife, whoever. They don't look over at plumbing truck. We do because we're like, hey, I know that guy. They don't. They're not. Look, they're not making eye contact with some guy in a construction deal because they don't want him like you know, the you whole cat whistle thing. They don't want that happening. But you got to realize you make those impressions with your logo very clean, and then one day, you know, a, a, a logo that has a simple name that I can read instantly, and then one day I'm looking for you two years later, and I'm searching, and I go, oh. There's five guys here. Who's I remember that guy for some, I'm gonna call them because you don't understand how many people are looking for guys in the trades that are worried, contract I'm hiring a contractor, I'm concerned. You don't know how many of them are looking and if they can just find anything that goes, okay, I've seen those guys before. You know, you can just put I'll tell you one of the greatest things is putting stuff at football games. It's not very expensive and the people are so happy that you you know, that you support their team and they're like, hey, you're local to our community and they see it and they'll, they'll go, they'll call you and it may not be right as the, as the game's going, but, you know, a year later, we actually had a 50% increase in one of the areas because we did a program with the football team. So it's, so the tools are, 
Yeah, if you're going to do home services, marketing is a big one. You, you have to don't don't overspend in marketing. Spend what you what you can to get what you've done. You know, don't don't get crazy and, and start going, hey, I'm going to there's a guy that went doing TV and you're like, you know, 30 percent spending. Go, Dude, you can't do that. That's impossible. Like that's you can't get that done. So find strategies and marketing is a you know, marketing books and things like that are great tools. Like I said, good logo, good name. Good, 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 you know, wrap, you know, really clean. The, the biggest mistake we make is to go to the wrap shop, they have an artist there, and we just go, here's my name, figure something out, and then they come up with all this stuff. Man, don't be scared to copy people across the country. One of the guys in Indiana, he was an electrician, he was in the group, goes, hey, let me show you my truck. See, what you think of it? It was really cool. He kind of did this old-timey, you know, like milk truck type thing with like the cream color. It was like, almost like that fossil brand that, that kind of retro look it was really cool he's gonna have the moon caps like on the side of the tires all that deal and 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 i go that's awesome but i said is anybody gonna really look at that and go oh wow i said man who's the biggest guy in y'all's group he goes oh well milestone gus santos go red and yellow you know red and yellow is the most used advertising the most noticed color i said and, and he to this day five years later goes Dude, you don't understand. Thank you so much. Yeah. You, even though I love that look, I love that thing. You don't understand how much that has helped us and how much that, that color and the wrap and the look. So don't go cheap and just go to the guys and say, Hey, here's, you know, make us, we had an ad agency at the time that we did the logo and everything. And so they put the whole wrap of the truck together. We went through, gosh, I don't know, like 10 of them. But the ones that we got from the wraps co wrap companies that we thought were cool because nobody wrapped their truck back then, we're comparing them and we're like, I like this is night and day, you know. So, well, I got to tell you, this is how, and we I know we've gone over. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. This, this is real. Cool. I do appreciate you coming by, guys. This is Jimmy Dale, Baker Brothers Plumbing, and I'm gonna say in Dallas, really y'all are mesquite. Yeah, but you own. The Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, the, the the biggest, the most reputable plumbing company around. That is phenomenal, uh, and you know I hope you all learned a lot through this. I know I did not go through near as many comments as I normally do. I didn't even go back to the grill once. I, my clothes are probably ready by now, or probably burned out by now. But and this has been fun. I, I do appreciate you coming. Up. I oh, think thanks. That, I think they got a lot out of this. Oh, well, thank you. So, if y'all want to learn about him, he's he's really good at it. it has been for a long time. So, thank you very much. I'll be back next week. Hopefully, I'm not still sick, but uh, I'll be better by then. I promise. Actually, I'll be back on Monday. I'll be ready to go. So, again, Baker Brothers Plumbing in, in Mesquite. They're all over Dallas. Check out their web page. Look and see what all they do. Look and see how they do it. Again, like. Like Tommy Mello says, R and D, rip off and duplicate. And I'm not saying just take his website and make it yours, but look at what he does right. Best practices are what it's all about. The tools, the softwares, the mentors, the coaches, any training, any education you can get is amazing. So I just want to say thank y'all very much. I do appreciate y'all being here today. And maybe next Saturday we won't talk so much. Probably not. But anyway, hopefully we'll see y'all there. I'm Roger Wakefield, Lead AP, helping you make more money in the trades.